I'm teaching through this series on Psalms, and and uh, and I, and we we talked about the importance of sometimes when you don't know how to pray, or or you know when you're just kind of struggling with God, just speaking Psalms out, and because a lot of them are prayers. And last week, remember we last week we looked at the prayer of King David after. He was probably in one of his darkest places in his life ever. And I called it, God, please fix me. And that's on our website if you want to go there and listen to that last week. We had quite a few people come up that really had a life-changing experience last week, hearing what it was like to... to uh, to do what King David did. I mean, a, he had sins like we'll never get to, hopefully, and yet his, uh, he came out of the dark with God, and, and that was through Psalm 51. So that's a great prayer. Today's is different. David is in another place. David, if, if you know the story, the Hebrew people used to not have a king and uh, because God was their king. And God talked to them through prophets and judges. And it came to a point where the Hebrew people said, we want a king. So God said, okay, you pick him. You pick him. And they picked Saul. Saul was the prettiest, the biggest, the handsome, the strongest, the biggest warrior, all of that kind of stuff. All the things you would want for a king to be, except he wasn't connected to God like a king should be. So Saul went along and, and just did all kinds of crazy things, getting the Hebrew people in trouble and, and himself in trouble. And in the middle of this, God went out and has come to him and he said, you're going to be the new king. Well, it's not time for him to be king yet. So guess what King Saul is trying to do? Kill David. He wants to kill off David. Well, David could kill off Saul he could. We already know he killed the giant, right? By the way, it, it, it's amazing how influence works on people because it was a really big deal that David killed off Goliath. But after that, the Hebrew people were killing off giants all the time. You know, all it takes is somebody going out in faith and doing something. But now, but now David is practicing patience because he knows he can kill Saul, but he's waiting. He's waiting. So he's dealing with things like patience, and he's dealing with fear. And, and we're going to look at, that's what we're going to look at today in Psalm 27, if you want to go there in your notes. And, uh, and the first thing, and I'm calling this, how to conquer fear. See that, see that second row, the second from the back row right here. See that row? <laughs> Y'all got five people in your row. You know what? Did you notice that? Am I counting that right? Y'all got five? Y'all got five people on your row. Well, here's what statistics say. You ready? One of you guys suffer with some kind of anxiety disorder. It's not just anxiousness or melancholy. It's something that affects your life in a very negative way. Now, it may not be anybody on that row because I picked the most perfect row for that. So, so don't worry about that. But, 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 but the thing we got to realize is, first of all, we all deal with fear and anxiety a little bit. But statistics say that one in five of Americans are messed up by it to the fact that it affects the way they leave to go to work and how they raise their family and everything. And, 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 and I'm going to read you for something from the American Psychological Association. But, but here's, here's what I want you to see first. Here's the first thing I put on your notes. Fear impairs your spiritual hearing. Fear impairs your spiritual hearing. That's why, you know, when I talk about faith being a leap, it, it's important for us to realize, you know, why we do what we do. I'm, I'm watching you guys from the back, and I'm listening to you sing the worship songs, and, and, and I'm thinking, you know, is everybody right now, are they being able to forget about all the fears and the junk that they deal with, and are they focusing on God? Because really, fear impairs our spiritual hearing. It, it messes us up. When, when you feel fear or anxiety coming on you, your default nature as a human being is not to go to God for comfort. You know that, don't you? I mean, think about it. When we get a little bit anxious, we, we, we start thinking how we can look better, how we can think better, how we can do this better, how we can whatever. We look to books. Man, you, you know, all you got to do is... is 
you can be the most worst author in the world. All you got to write is how to live a better life and you'll sell millions of them. You know, all you got to do is get somebody to get behind you. But that's because that's what everybody's looking for. But we've all got this fear and anxiety we struggle with. And, and, and instead of going to God, we usually wait until we're hurting really bad to go to God. Or we're not with God all the time. And then we go to God a little bit when we start worrying and stuff. And if we don't find immediate relief, then we back off and we start trying to feel fix it again. Now, it's amazing. It's always been amazing to me that, that on the love list, God says, this is what love is all about, and this is how you handle love. And if you're going to be the kind of Christian you need to be, this is what you need to be. What's the first thing on the love list? Patience. Now, isn't it interesting? Because I want to promise you, you can't do being kind and forgiving others and all those other things without having patience. So that's not, that's not our default nature to go back to God. Our default nature is, is to try to fix it the way humans fix it. Nearly one in five Americans have been diagnosed with some form of anxiety disorder. This ranges from panic attacks and post-traumatic stress disorder or social phobias or obsessive compulsive disorder, you name it. Now, this is diagnosis. These are people who have been diagnosed and, and by, the, by, the American, by psychologists, and they said, this is how we fix it. We're going to give you medicine. And I told you last week, I'm not against medicine, and sometimes we need medicine. But how many people you know that are on medicine that don't feel relief? They just got enough relief that they can go to work and do their job. They're not feeling joy. They're not feeling uh, peace. They're not feeling comfort. They're, they're, not, they're not getting counsel. They're, they're not going to God. And then you've got all the people that just kind of like you and me, all of us people that just struggle with anxiety sometimes, and you just got to connect. Now, like I said, I'm not against pills. I've had people sit in my counseling office before and say, look, we're not even going to get past this if you don't start crying. Go get a pill. And then we start working through things and, and, and kind of go from there. This guy that wrote this article, this study was in, says, when something stressful happens, a deadline approaches or travel plans go awry, the fight or flight response floods the brain, your anxiety is turned on, and, and that's what happens. Now, that's a natural human thing. It's natural. It's, anxiety is like a temptation to go somewhere you're not supposed to. It's not a sin to get anxious. How you handle your anxiety, it, how you handle your depression, how you handle your grief, how you handle the things you do, that's, that's where you go. And, and those are things that you're going to struggle with. But if you're handling them with God, it, it makes all the difference in the world. Their answer, the medical world's answer, medication. Can I tell you something? If you're taking antidepressants, anti-anxiety drugs, if you're taking any kind of drugs at all that are to alter the way you feel and your behavior, if you are not getting counseling or working on it spiritually, you're just being drugged. And there's a really good chance you'll never change and you'll just have to rely on more drugs in the future. Again, I'm not against drugs. But there's other things that go. And, and if you're ever going to get fixed and if you're ever going to change, there's really not a chance if you have a medical doctor that's just telling you drugs, 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 drugs. But we struggle with things. I just wrote down some fears I think that all of us struggle with. Now, I'm going to talk about these as being fears because there's, when, when something becomes a problem, it's when the fear affects you. If, if you've got a fear of snakes... That's not a big deal. Lots of people have fear of snakes. But if you have a fear of snakes so you won't leave your bedroom, then that's a problem, you know? If, if, if you've got a fear of, of people and, and, and how they're going to respond, and so you always feel like you have to be on your best or whatever, and that's an anxiety you have, well, that's not so bad. But if you get the anxiety so bad that you stay away from work and you stay in your home, and th you know what I'm saying? So, so that's when it goes over the top. But, but we all struggle with financial fears, fear of relationships, getting our needs met by others. Our self-worth is based on the fact whether we think how other people feel about us. Uh, this kind of fear sabotages your relationships. It just sabotages. You remember, you, you just, one sorry relationship after another, there's got to come a point where you go, dude, it can't be all these people. It has to come back to me, right? The fear of failure. Uh, you, w if, when we have a fear of failure, we can get to the point where we don't start anything because we have this fear of failure. Fear of someone finding out who you really are. 
And again, if you're, when you're close to God, there are things you change in your life that people don't even know about. The things you think about, the things you watch, the things that will, that will mess you up internally and, and eventually affect you uh, externally. But, but those kind of things change from God. Look at Matthew 13, 22. Matthew 13, 22, Jesus is telling a parable about a farmer who goes out and spreads some seed. And, and this is, he's talking about the gospel here or the word of God. So he says, he says, he says, when the farmer goes out or when God goes out and he spreads the word of God, then, then it, it, depending on the dirt that it lands in tells how prosperous it's going to be. And, and obviously the, the dirt that's cultivated right and fertilized right and all that, it's going to grow like crazy. The, some of it is going to hit the hard, you know, the, you know, the hard heart. You know, the person you've invited to go to church for a long time and their, their heart is still hard and they're hardened toward that. They're, the gospel isn't going to affect them until there starts being a change in there. But, but then there's one that he mentions and it's this one. Then there's the seed that fell among the thorns, and the thorns represent those who hear God's word, but are all too quickly, the message is crowded out, say this with me, by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth. And then, then what? So no fruit is produced. Now, this happens to all of us. This isn't just, this isn't just the brand new Christian. This is a, there are people who go to church every single Sunday. There are people who get up and have a quiet time and pray and, and, and read their Bible every day of the week. But, but they're worried about things. There are things that they're worried about all the time. And you know what that's doing? It's hardening them. It's strangling out the Word of God. They read the Word of God, but it really doesn't mean anything powerful to them. It might mean something powerful to them while they're sitting there having their quiet time, but as soon as they get to work and they feel like they've let somebody down or, or this didn't happen or I don't look good enough today or whatever those things are that make them fearful, it squashes out. It's, it, it just chokes the power of the word out of them. This is so common. And, 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 and if you don't know it, the fruit that's produced, the scripture tells us what fruit is, and I'm sorry I didn't put this uh, passage in your notes, but write it down. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Just write that down and then look at it later. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. You guys, most of you have heard this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So we have a love list to check to see if we're doing love right. Love is patient. Love is kind. We also have a list to see if we're going about hanging out with the Spirit and being close to God. So like I said, if you're struggling with anxiety, you're struggling with depression, you're, 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 you're struggling with fears all the time, they're just squeezing out your relationship with God, well, here's how you can tell. Are you having love, feeling love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness? Now, here's, here's how the devil works. This is so powerful. I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you, the guy's gone, so none of you know him. He's had a terrible couple of years, and, and he was in the dark and struggling, and life just stunk, and, and it had and been going on for about 10 years. His family life had gone apart. He'd lost his job, and everything you can think of just about to, to go, boy, that guy's life stinks. Boy, I'm glad I'm not that guy. You know what I'm saying? You know, when your wife says, honey, don't worry. Your life could be like this. We'd be pointing at that guy. And he came to me after the service just all emotional. He said, I just realized today I've been in the dark for 10 years. And I've reconnected with God. And I prayed for him. And, and he said uh, his life turned around completely. While it, all of this stuff was going on, he left with a peace in his heart he hadn't had in 10 years. I'm just telling you. But it takes the commitment to get there. It takes the commitment to get there. Let's look at, let's just look at some things. Uh, three different things to conquer. 
and, and uh, life-changing things. And remember, you got to remember, this isn't just a lesson you can check off. And, you know, I talk to people all the time that read all these books. I read lots of books. I learn from books. And there are things that I don't do that are in the books. But people are always excited about all these things they read. And, and you can go back and ask them a year ago, are you doing those things? No, nah, I read another book. And it totally, you know what I'm saying? But here's the book. Here's the book. And if you'll check off these things, and then if you'll live it, not just go, oh, I know a cool thing I can tell my boss at work. No, live it. The key is living, not just knowing. Believing with your heart is not just saying, I believe in Jesus. Believing in your heart means, I believe in Jesus, so I live like Jesus. That's what believing in your heart means. That's what faith is. That's taking that step to make that happen. So the first thing is, we got to learn to conquer the fear of the moment. Because what will happen is, is, is something will come on. I, I want to tell you something. In the last... Since March, I've been involved with seven deaths. Now, we've had a pretty young church, so historically, I do two to three funerals a year. Seven since March. And the weird thing is, maybe it's because I'm older now, it's heavy on me. It is heavy. And the other night, I was laying in bed. And I, Lisa was asleep, and I went, I might die tonight. What if I died tonight? What would happen to Lisa if I died tonight? How would Poppy feel if I died tonight? Dude, it was eating me up. I mean, it was just, it was just, it, it, I got up and I started walking around the house and, and I started talking to God and, and it took a little while. But, you know, I was worrying about something that possibly couldn't happen. I might live to be 90 or 100 or whatever, but, but that's what we do. we got to learn how when the fear comes on us and we start thinking about things, what do we do? What do we do? How do you get out of that? And, and some of you may have been in it a while, and you need somebody to kick your butt or, or God to do something. And unfortunately, sometimes it takes a really bad thing to happen in your life. You go, oh, i got to wake up and start living it every day like it means something. We've got to learn to conquer the fear of the moment. And the LEAP verse for this week, and if you're a guest, LEAP stands for listen, engage, apply, and produce. So every single week we put a LEAP verse. But the LEAP verse, leap verse is Psalm 27.1. So just think about it. King David, he's, he's not king yet, but he's been told he's going to be king. And Saul knows that he's supposed to be king, and he knows that people are starting to like him. So Saul wants to kill him. So there's a little bit of fear there. Would anybody have fear, you know? Uh, at least I didn't track him on Facebook and find him. He had to go out on the horses and find him. So look what it says. Now this would be, again, this is a great psalm to just pray out loud. The Lord is my light and salvation. The Lord clears things up for me. The, the Lord helps me understand the, 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 the darkness and, and stay away from the darkness and, and stay focused on the light. The cool thing about the light is, is you know where to go. It's like a lighthouse. You can be out in the middle of the dark and all you see is, is shark floating around the water and, and, and all of this kind of stuff happening. You're going, well, how do I get out of here? Ding, light. Light. And you focus on the light. And the cool thing the light does is even while you're still in the middle of all the circumstances going on, when you're focused on the light, there's hope. And, and you start feeling comfort from that. And the closer you get to it, and the cool thing is, your light is right here. God is there. So all it takes, now sometimes it takes getting through the junk. Like I said, I got up and walked around the house several times last night, the other night, before I could even get to where I even heard God or felt God's presence or anything, because all I was thinking about, I'm about to die. You're my light and my salvation. You know what salvation is? You're my rescuer. You're going to rescue me. No matter what, even if I die. You know, here's the deal. Because here's where I went the other night. I, I hear people say all the time, boy, I can't wait to die. I'm a Christian. I get baloney. 
first of all, I don't think there's anybody really that just wants to die. Because I'll just tell you, it's faith. And we don't, you know, we know God tells us all this stuff. But I'll tell you the people that know, when I stand beside somebody's death in their bed and they're dying, they know. I don't know if God makes that stronger for them. I don't know if when you're laying there, God starts going, it's going to be like this. You just wait. It's going to be heaven. It's not time yet, but you're going to come soon. I don't know if that's all he's doing. But when I talk to those people, they're like, they're ready. I'm not ready. I'll just tell you. If something happens to me tonight and the doctor tells me I'm about gone, I'll be ready. But right now I got grandbabies to bring up and, and fun stuff to do and, and other people to tell about Jesus. And, and those are all really important things in my life. So I walked around the house a few times, and, and then I finally went, okay, God, if it's time for me to go, you're going to take care of everything. But, but then God started giving me a peace. But it takes that focus, be focusing on the light. You're my light, and you're my rescuer, no matter what, even if it's here, even no matter if I stay in the bad here for the rest of my life, I'm still going to be rescued for eternity. So why should I be afraid? The Lord is my what? fortress protecting me from danger so why should i tremble that's psalm 27 1 you got to ask yourself is the lord god my light is he my rescuer is he my safe place if you'll take those three things and when you're praying and and you have a fear come up or whatever that fear in the moment you got to ask yourself okay is the lord my light is he my rescuer is he my safe place Makes a difference, doesn't it? Because your husband can't be your safe place. I, I did a funeral one year. The, the guy walked out to get the mail and croaked on the front yard. I went to the funeral home with a lady and she was in so much shock she couldn't even answer the funeral home person funeral home person would say, well, what do you think about this coffin? She'd look at me. And I'd go, well, I think that's okay. And the funeral person would go, what do you want this? She'd look at me. Total shock. Now she got out of it. She's healthy today and all that, and all that kind of stuff. But, but God is our light. He's our salvation. He's our rescue, our safe place. That's, that's where we go. That's where we go. And when we're having a hard time getting there, we're God's love with skin. And sometimes, I went to see a friend last week. I got a friend at Parkland Hospital, and I just want to tell you something. I didn't even know what to say to him. I'm a paid holy man. He was an old friend of mine. Matter of fact, when I tell you all the story about the first time I ever saw Lisa, it was on the, back, it was on the tailgate of Max's truck. Max is at Parkland. So I walk in, and I'm a pastor, and I'm a friend, and I don't know what to say. But you just be there, and you just love, and, and we need each other for that. I need that. I love it when one of y'all sends me an encouraging text just in the middle of the day. I can't tell you what a difference it makes, because sometimes it's in the middle of something that I need to be shown the light, you know? And that's why we need each other. That's what it's all about. I, I just, I, again, when I used to counsel, I, I spent so much time trying to get people to reconnect with God and each other. When evil people come to devour me, he says, when I'm tempted, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. See, when you're, when you're looking at God as your light and your rescue and your safe place, no matter what's going on around you, God is going to keep you up and strong. You're not going to stumble. The other people are going to stumble. You're not going to fall into the, into the temptation. But you won't do this naturally. You have to continue to remind yourself because you'll try to take care of it like us humans do. Verse 3, though a mighty army surrounds me, say this with me, my heart will not be afraid. When uh, we had a guy named Scoop who was one of our first L.C. Sears, and, and I had to stand over him and tell him, Scoop, we're about to unplug you. He's wide awake. He just can't breathe. He's wide awake. He's not out of it. He's wide awake. Scoop, I'm going to tell you something, buddy. We're about to unplug you. Is that okay? Yeah. And his family's standing around. I'm going, Scoop. I just want to say again so that your family understands. You nod real big, right? Okay. We're about to unplug you. That means you're going to die. I said, you're okay with that? 
And I said, and I pulled the family around. I said, do you, Scoop, do you want to? And he goes, and he wanted a pen. He couldn't talk. He had this thing shoved down. This was breathing for him, right? So, so he, he, he writes something to the grandson. And, and I don't even think he even knew, but the grandson seemed to be the one that was most fearless, fearful of him dying. So he writes something comforting to the grandson. He wrote something comforting to his daughter. He wrote something uh, comforting to me. And, 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 and he put the paper down. He went, dude, there was peace. There was not a bit of fear in his eyes. He was so ready to leave. He was ready. He was ready. And, 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 and you're, when you're surrounded, you're, you're not afraid and you remain confident. And your confidence comes from that hope. He knew when I close my eyes here and I take my last breath, I'm going to wake up in the arms of God. Now, I want to tell you something. I don't think any of us can really understand that because we're not laying there about to take our last breath. But when you get there, you're gonna, you're gonna, even if you give, even if you give your life to Christ at the very end, you're gonna, you're gonna know. Verse four, the one thing I ask of the Lord is the, the thing I seek the most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating on his temple. If you want comfort, hope, peace, joy, love, you've got to live your life like verse 4. Lord, all I want to do is focus on you. Now, this isn't crazy. You don't have to run around yelling hallelujah and holding the sign up saying Jesus loves you. If you don't love him, you're going to hell or whatever all these people do that are out there. You just have to live your life. It's a hard thing. You have to live your life in peace and you go forward. And, what I, and the cool thing is Jesus fixed it to where we're the temple. So he dwells in us all the time. All we have to do is recognize and be ready for him to, to minister to us. Verse 5, for he will conceal me. He will conceal me there when troubles come. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. He's going to protect me from all of this stuff that go, goes on. That's how we deal with our fears now. And then verse 6, Then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me. This is, this is the thing about being above reproach. Christians are supposed to live their lives in such a way that when we're tempted to do something we're not supposed to, we're standing head and, and eyes above that. At, this, at his sanctuary... I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy. He's saying, I will worship him. I will worship him. I will worship him. You're worshiping God when you're doing stuff for him. That's why you do things, to, to worship him, not to get patted on the back. By the way, if you hadn't figured it out yet, if you're doing something for God to get patted on the back, you've got a heart problem. Number two, so the first thing is we've got to conquer the fear of now. Number two, we've got to conquer the fear of failing God. We got to conquer the fear of failing God. The most positive thing you can know is that if you fail, you can fail forward and you can learn from it. Some of, some of the, the, the most successful people out there are the ones who learn, when I fail, I can go forward. Now, when you're doing this with God, when you're learning to fall forward, you know that God is merciful. You know that God is loving. You know that God is a, is a father who wants to pick you up off the ground and, and wipe off your knees and pat you on the butt and, so you can go on and be the person that you need to be. That's what God is. There's great comfort in knowing that God is that. God, the cool thing is God's mercy and God forgives you when you fail him. He forgives you so you don't have to get caught up in the shame. Verse 7, he says, Hear me as I pray, O Lord. Be merciful. Answer me. Verse 8, he says, My heart has heard you say, Come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. What if you just lived every day like that? And then, and then look at verse 9. This is so powerful. And verse 10, because, because some of us, we, <clears throat> what we have to be careful of, we can't measure God according to our parents. We just can't. And here's a perfect reason why. Verse 9, do not turn your back on me. Do not reject your servant in anger. You have always been my helper. 
Don't leave me now. Don't abandon me, O God of my salvation. God, my rescuer. Then look at verse 10. Ready? Even my father and mother abandoned me. But the Lord will hold me close. Do that as hope. No matter what, that's hope for your failure. That's hope for, there's a whole lot of people that they've got fear going on and they're just stuck where they're at and they're not even going forward. And, and I want to tell you something. If you're thinking, I want to make my life better, how do I do it? I'll just tell you, don't go out and buy a self-help book. Take this and don't just read it, live, live it. If you have a King James Version, you don't even understand it. Royal, I don't understand Shakespeare. Then, then you go buy a New Living Translation. I, the New Living Translation is one of the most modern and good, good translation. I know Greek scholars that have told me that the NLT is, they think is the best translation out there in modern language. NIV is a good translation. If you've got a King James Version, your excuse is, I can't understand my Bible, buy one. If you can't, I'll give you one. And we have a lot of people in here that have Bibles all over the place that are gathering dust, and somebody will give you one. I promise you. So read, study it, live it. The key is live it. Number three, conquer the fear of whatever lies ahead. Whatever lies ahead. Conquer the fear of whatever lies ahead. Practice staying in God's presence at all times. That's really the key. Because be, let's just be honest. I'm not going to ask anybody to hold up their hands or sing their alma mater. Just listen. Most of the time. Now, a lot of us pray at dinner. You ought to hear Poppy Grace pray sometime at dinner. That, that lady can pray. And Jeb's getting it, too. And I love Jeb ends it not in amen. He says, I'm in. I think that's the way we ought to end all of our prayers now. <laughs> right? Shouldn't we end all of our prayers with I'm in? Nobody understands amen anyway. You know? But, but what if... What if you were in God's presence all the time? What if you just practiced because you can, because he's spirit and because through Jesus he lives in you? What if you just all the time you knew that God was in your presence and, and you were in God's presence? You can pray to him in the car. You can pray to him when you're walking down the, the aisle at work. You can, you, can, you can pray to him when you're going up to present a, a sales opportunity. You can, you can all the time you practice God's presence. And the cool thing is when you are always practicing God's presence, when you get slapped in the face, guess where? you'll fall back on God automatically you'll fall back on God but but here's the deal we don't automatically go to God so we have to turn it into a discipline and y'all know how disciplines work some of you guys have trained for marathons and thought you were going to run for the rest of your life and the day the marathon went over you stopped running and you got out of a habit and like a month later you couldn't run to the mailbox that's what happens spiritually you know, my wife made me stop playing softball because I kept getting weekend warrior injuries. You know what a weekend warrior injury is? It's an injury that comes to someone who doesn't ever use their body for exercise except when they go play softball. You know, that's how it is spiritually. You have to be working on your life spiritually and then you'll automatically fall back into God's arms and you'll be ready for any single thing that happens. Look what he says in verse 11. Teach me how to live, O oh God. And don't just read it. Do it. Lead me along the right path, for my enemies are waiting on me. The temptation, the devil is there. Verse 12. Do not let me fall into their hands. How? Stay in God's presence all the time. And the, here's the cool thing. When you stay in God's presence, as soon as you mess up, you go, oh. Oh, God, I am so sorry. And you repent. It doesn't mean you're not ever going to make a mistake. You're not ever going to make a bad choice. It just means you're going to repent in instantly if you're hanging out with God. For they accuse me of things, he says, I've never done. They, they, with every breath, they threaten me with violence. Focus on God's goodness. And know that he wants what's best for you in the context. Remember, scripture is so much and being God is so much and being context. People think, man, if I just live a good enough life, I can buy a Mercedes. If buying a Mercedes will further the kingdom, I can guarantee you God's going to make that happen for you. 
You know, maybe you're supposed to be a Mercedes Uber driver. Maybe God's got that plan for you. But you're not supposed to just be playing with your Mercedes. You're supposed to be locking people in the back seat and sharing the gospel while you drive them around in your Mercedes. Now, that could happen, but you'll never know until you try it. You've, you've got to go forward, and, and, and you've got to realize no matter what happens, no matter how many people die in your life, no matter how many jobs you lose, no matter how many people hurt you, no matter what, God's going to use all that for the good. And you know what the good is? For the good of the kingdom. He wants to grow the kingdom. And I want to tell you something else. Everybody's mad about God, about America, and we got to get back into God's grace. America is not God's people. The church that lives in America is God's people. The Hebrew people are God's people. You know the ones that people are going, oh, let the Arabs blow them up. You know what I'm saying? Those really are God's people. But we're God's people. You know, freedom, we need to put prayer back in school. Well, let me tell you something. If your kid's going to a Muslim school, that's good, guess which God they're going to have to pray to? You know, I mean, you got to think about the things we argue about. We're the church. And all of those things about God's people, that's us. And we're supposed to be changing people with the way we live our lives and by giving people love, not trying to get them to change their rules to be the way we want to be our thing. Verse 13, I am confident. How does he get there? I will see the Lord's goodness while I'm here in the land of the living. It's easier to be patient if you are confident. Would you agree? It's easier to be patient if you're confident. And then here, I'm finished up with verse 14. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Now, let me just talk one second about what this is not. God wants you going forward. One of the biggest excuses Christians have for not doing anything is I'm praying about it. I'm praying about it. You got any resumes out? No, but I'm praying about it. You start going forward, and then you be patient as you go forward. Oop, that didn't work. Oop, that doesn't work. When that happens, don't bail on God. I'm always afraid to bail on God. You know why? I'm afraid that if I bail today, he had something cool planned for me tomorrow. I just struggle with that all the time. If I even think about bailing on God, it's like, dude, you're going to miss tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? But that is so important. Wait patiently for the Lord, but go forward and be courageous. Be brave, yet be patient, knowing that God's going to use everything you do to make the kingdom life grow to what it's supposed to. So this is, we go, as a church, we go into our time with God. And just a couple of things I want to give you to pray about and think about and challenge you on. Let me ask you some questions. How are you when fear comes up in the moment? Do you immediately go to God or do you start trying to fix it or uh uh-oh or whatever? In your health, in your finances, in dealing with your children, in your spouse? And then ask yourself, is God your light, your rescuer? Is he your safe place? What a cool thing that, what if you woke up every morning and went, okay, God, today you're going to be my light you're going to be my rescuer, and you're going to be my safe place. And then later on, God, you're going to be my light, you're going to be my rescuer, you're going to be my safe place. How about when you mess up, when you fail, can you just confess, repent, and learn to go forward and be stronger than you were before? Those are good things to pray about. Worry about your future. Because the key to now and the future and the past even is staying connected with God.